from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It is a great pleasure to be here with my friend Alice McDermott, the celebrated novelist. Alice was born in Brooklyn and lived most of her childhood in Long Island. We're very lucky to have her living with her family here in the Washington area, where she teaches writing at Johns Hopkins University. Her seven novels include Charming Billy, which won the National Book Award, along with After This, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. But she does that all the time. She, she's been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize three times. Her most recent novel is called Someone. Reviewing it in your favorite newspaper, Roxana Robinson wrote, McDermott reminds us that this is how things work, that life unfolds in small moments without dazzle. This kind of novel is necessary to us. It expands our understanding. It enlarges our souls. Is that nice? That's nice. That's nice. <laughs> Thank you, Roxanne. That's nice. <laughs> so I understand you, you didn't grow up expecting to be a professional novelist. When, uh, when did that whole idea come to you as a possibility? Um, no, well, first, thank you, Ron, um, and thanks to the Library of Congress, um, especially to Elizabeth Pugh, who has been my uh, escort uh, for the day. And thank you, all of you, for not going to the beach this weekend. Yes. And sorry for all of you who didn't get in to see Doris Kearns Goodwin, <laughs> but you're welcome here. I mean, history is history, you know? We're talking about important things, novels. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so uh, no, I certainly didn't grow up uh, being encouraged to be a novelist. Um, but as I often tell my students, there aren't many children in their cribs whose parents say, uh, you will be a novelist and you must start writing right away. Um, I was one of those kids who read a lot, of course, and always wrote stories, uh, kept journals um, in which I would narrate things that never actually happened to me in the hope that someone would find them and be impressed with what an interesting life this seven-year-old has. Um, but nobody, I mean, even though I was always writing and I, I went to an all-girl Catholic high school, um, and in all-girl Catholic high schools in that era, uh, we had skits all the time. What do you mean? Skits, like little plays. You wrote them? And I wrote them. I was the official skit writer. Um, and you know, it was Teacher Appreciation Day. We need a skit. You know, it's sports night. We need a skit. Um, I'm not. I don't know what happened to skits. <laughs> they were sort of like mini um, comedy routines um, or, or little little situation comedies that you would try to do. Anyway, I did this, and no one ever said to me, "Wow, you like to write," or "Wow, your skit won first place." Um, one nun did say to me, "You know." you could go to Hollywood and write for Carol Burnett. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, I want to be F. Scott Fitzgerald. I don't really want to write for Carol Burnett. Um, so no, it really wasn't until I got to college um, and I went to uh, the State University of New York at Oswego. And I was such a serious student. Um, I chose Oswego because it was, it was rated the number three party school that year. Um, <laughs> by Playboy magazine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went and, and I, I went with the intention of being a sociology major because sociology sounded like something you studied in college. Um, and, uh, but like to write, read and write, took some English classes, took a class called The Nature of Nonfiction at the beginning of my sophomore year. Um, and our first assignment was to write an autobiographical essay. So I went off and wrote an autobiographical essay um, about something that, again, never happened. Um, it didn't happen to me. It didn't happen to anybody I knew. But it made a good story. Um, and so I made up this story, used the first person, and, and brought it to this professor. Um, and uh, he was uh, into audiovisual. I'm really dating myself. Audiovisual aids, uh, which which meant um, using a, an overhead projector to to look at our writing. And and he would put our words up on this big screen, um, and with his wax pencil, go oh, through every that sentence that you wrote. If oh, you know, if extra words, you need a comma. That should have been a semicolon. It was all there for the whole class to see. So he did this to my little autobiographical essay. 
And then he said, McDermott, after class, I want to see you. So I thought he was going to say, you know, nature of nonfiction. Um, and what he said to me was, I got bad news for you, kid. You're a writer, and you'll never shake it. It's a monkey on your back. That's when I knew. Nice. Yeah. And you started writing short stories, and you had really early success placing some short stories, right? I did. Um, you know, it, it seems, looking back, fairly easily. Um, it's not. I was, yeah, <laughs> right, it's not. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough, I did go on and get a master's in English at the University of New Hampshire, and I uh, studied with a wonderful novelist there named Mark Smith, um, who told me, you need it, you know, if you're going to write a novel, you need an agent. Um, and I started a novel, and he said, okay, I'm sending you to someone who I think is one of the best agents in New York. And um, I had 100 pages of my first novel. I literally had not written page 101 uh, when a young, at the time, young editor at Houghton Mifflin named Jonathan Glassy uh, gave me a contract for the book, which wow. meant I had to finish it. That was The Bigamist Daughter. The Bigamist Daughter, yes. Which you published 30 years ago? Yeah. Oh when you gosh, were eight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It was all made up. It didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> the, so many of the characters in your novels uh, are frequently looking back. They, they're either trapped or they're entranced by the past, like Marie in your new novel, Someone. What is it that draws you to that theme of retrospection? I think probably um, as a storyteller, um, the, the thing that fascinates me most is how so much memory is storytelling. I mean, our memories in many ways are the stories we tell ourselves. Um, and it seems to me that what's dynamic about the storytelling slash memory um, is that uh, the stories can change over time. Uh, the way we look at the stories can change over time. Um, events, big things that happen, and I guess this is why I don't have a lot of big things happening within my fiction. It, it strikes me that events are finite. Even the worst things happen and then stop happening, um, and then it's over. Um, terrible things, wonderful things, um, but, but, the, but they're all brief uh, in, in, in most respects. But what we have to say about the things that have happened to us um, continues and changes. And to look at, at an event that happened yesterday, to look at that event five years down the road, to look at that event 50 years later, um, is a different thing. It's an exercise in a different kind of storytelling each time because what subsequent events then change the way we look at those things. Um, in the opening pages of my latest novel, Someone, which opens when the, the main character uh, is seven years old, so it's the late 20s, um, Brooklyn, New York. She's sitting on uh, the steps waiting for her father to come home to come up from the subway. And a neighbor, uh, a, a young woman comes up, Peggy Shahab. Um, and Peggy, the first line is something like Peggy Shahab comes up uh, in the, from the subway in the evening light. Uh, and it's springtime, she's wearing her spring coat, but she has soot on her coat because she works in Lower Manhattan, which Pegeen calls a filthy place. And as I was imagining that scene and trying to convey it to the reader, I was aware that for a contemporary reader, even if it was subconscious, I was in some way evoking the memory of 9-11. Coming up from the subway in the evening light, coming from lower Manhattan with a little bit of soot, soot on her spring coat. Um, and I don't think that you can be a contemporary reader, and even if you're not conscious of it, not somehow read those words, even though the time in which it takes place is a time way before that happened. Um, but, and I guess this is the thing I, I hope for with attentive readers, not so much that, that immediately you say, oh, this is a book about 9-11, but in a more subtle way, that sense of loss, that sense of catastrophe, that sense of the precariousness of life that we were all confronted with on that day will somehow be evoked subtly 
through that description. And so that's, that's what always fascinates me, how to use uh, various events to give a new story to things in the past. It's something of a cliche that great novelists are born of traumatic childhoods. Did you, did you have a particularly difficult childhood? Is there a lot of trauma you're working through in your novels? Well, see, I'd have more events in my novels. <laughs> <laughs> then I could write about the really hot stuff. <laughs> no, I mean, I suppose the only trauma of my childhood um, was uh, that nobody let me complete a sentence. Um, I had two older brothers and a father with lots of opinions about things. Um, and, you know, at the dinner table, I never really got to say, I would say, hey, here's what I think, and that's about as far as I would get. Um, so in some ways, I think that's probably as traumatic as it got, but certainly the thing that um, drove me to complete sentences uh, in the silence of my own room. Oh, yeah? Uh, well, I didn't say that, but I could have. <laughs> you have an Irish, Irish Catholic background. You frequently write about Irish Catholics. Are you writing, though, out of some sort of autobiographical impulse or just what you know? Yeah, I think it's a little bit what I know. It's certainly, um, I, I don't feel that I'm writing out of events that, that I've experienced. Your um, family don't recognize events from the book. No, no. Um, uh, when I published uh, At Weddings and Wakes, which was uh, my third novel, but really the first novel that used the Irish-American community uh, in, in an obvious way, um, my poor, long-suffering mother read the book, and she said, well, I know this isn't our family, but how will anyone else know this isn't <laughs> our family? <laughs> and I was able to comfort her. I went on the book tour, and I was reading in La Jolla, California, at a bookstore, and the first question at the Q&A, somebody raised their hand and said, is this your family? And from the other side of the room, someone yelled out, no, it's mine. <laughs> 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 you once joked in an interview that the great benefit of writing about Irish Catholics is that they're all alike. Yeah. What, uh, what did you mean by that? Well, certainly it's a recognizable clan. Um, you know, the Irish are an island race, so, you know, we're limited um, in, in our phenotypes and our experiences. Um, but I think, you know, less than the Irishness uh, of it, um, the Catholicism is... As, is uh, what's interesting to me as a writer because it's the Catholicism that gives my characters a language for the spirit. It gives them a language for their interior life. Um, these are characters who would not wax philosophical uh, on life. They're, they're characters who uh, maybe have, haven't spent a lot of time um, in classrooms considering uh, the big questions about life. Um, but having been raised in a faith tradition, they have a vocabulary for those things I think we all wonder about and worry about um, and hope for um, and, and dread. Uh, so, so Catholicism gives them a way to talk about that interior life, those dark nights of the soul, or those moments of, of uh, unbelievable joy that are no less joyful when we understand that they are brief and passing. Love and, and children and family. Um, uh, so it's the Catholicism that, that gives these characters a way of thinking about those essential truths. But for me, it doesn't shut down the conversation. Um, having characters who have a faith tradition for me doesn't mean then that they don't doubt, that the faith doesn't often fail them, that what they believe at one time in their lives they might not be able to uh, evoke in another situation. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives them language, it gives me language to lend them, um, but I don't think it closes off, and I think that's a misconception about uh, characters and maybe even human beings um, who are of a faith, um, that it shuts down the conversation. For me, it only opens up the conversation um, and allows for contradiction um, because it raises the subject. Um, you know, is love redemptive? Uh, that is not a question that will often get asked, but it must be asked 
within the faith tradition because that's what the faith is based on. Why is religion such a taboo subject? Still, when we can write about literally anything, you don't see religion showing up in a country that is so religious, where people do worship regularly. Uh, why do we tend to see religion only, you know, fanaticism, abusive priests, gooey <laughs> new age spirituality, but not the sort of traditional religion that millions of Americans practice? Why isn't it showing up in literary fiction? You know, I think we're afraid of it. Um, I think there, there is a sense, um, I certainly have experienced it um, in interviews, that when you say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, I still, you know, yeah, I'm kind of a practicing Catholic, you know, and you can see whoever the interview, not you, but you can see, you know, in that eyes, not as bright as we thought she might be. <laughs> <you know? laughs> She's still hanging on. She hasn't seen the light, you know. It's not um, very sophisticated. Not very sophisticated. <clears throat> oh my God, you know. Now what am I going to ask her? <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, you know. So there's a self-consciousness consciousness about that. Um, and and again, I think there's also this, you know, perception that uh, that once faith comes into it, everything else falls away. Um, that there there can't be a questioning. There can't be a contradiction. Um, someone asked me recently about a, a character in someone um, who left the priesthood um, and, and the way she put the question was he left the priesthood which means his, he lost his faith. Um, and I thought, no, gosh, no, he left the priesthood, but you know, can you lose your faith permanently? Um, do you say, I don't believe anymore, I'm finished, I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, Poof. Poof, it's all gone, you know. Um, to reject, in his case, uh, Roman Catholicism, but I think any faith, especially one that, that you are raised in, to dismiss it outright, um, you just think about Christianity. Well, so then uh, all, all the religious art, dismiss that. Religious music, dismiss that. Other people who still believe, dismiss them. Um, it doesn't, it's not that simple. It's not that easy, lost and found. Now I got it, I don't have to think about it anymore. Now I lost it, I don't have to think about it anymore. There's so much in between. I love the way you explore that in your books. I think it's Thank you. almost unique in American fiction. <laughs> uh, let's talk about plot. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like most people, I turn to your novels for the car chases, the explosions, and the <laughs> sex scenes. <clears throat> <laughs> As our uh, reviewer noted, uh, <laughs> praising your novel, someone, she praised the way uh, life unfolds in small moments without dazzle. You know, how do you conceive of a book of small moments without dazzle? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, um, in some ways I'm, I'm inclined to disagree. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, if, if, if you think about it, um, in a book like someone, which yes. is a very short book, um, in the first few pages, uh, a woman walks up from the subways, but she's dead. But she dies. There's death. Something happens. Uh, I once, uh, trying to make this argument, said, if you changed all the people who die in my books to murdered, <laughs> they would be very exciting plots. <laughs> you know, just because they die of natural causes, it seems, you know, oh, well, pfft. That, that death, oh, that doesn't mean anything. Um, so, I mean, if Peggyne had been murdered in the, <laughs> in the first, um, I, again, I have a character who um, makes a vow, um, enters the priesthood and makes a vow and then breaks it. Um, I have characters uh, who um, have all kinds, of, there are all kinds of characters, um, of, of, a young man who was blinded in the First World War in the trenches, he's right there. I mean, there's lots happening here. Um, but, but there's the sense that it's, um, it's, it's not so much about the event, and I guess I'm going back to your initial yes. question, it's not so much about the event, it's more about the, the people, the individuals uh, who live them. And, and who are not defined by them, but who are themselves alone, living through things that all of us as human beings confront in one way or another. So when you can see, when you get a sense that a novel's coming, does it come to you as a plot, as a collection of characters, or as a voice? How does it form in your mind? You know, it, it, it's different every time with every story. Um, 
uh, with someone, for instance, it was really, for me, it was um, I wanted to give an entire novel over to a single woman's voice. Oh, we always hear that, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, why, why? Oh, yeah, all those single women's voices <laughs> that are just crowding the bestseller list. <laughs> why, why, <laughs> why was that so important to you? <laughs> Well, part of it was, I mean, it was two things that worked side by side, and I can't say that one was more important than the other. Um, one was that I thought of a character, okay, here's a woman coming of age over the course of the 20th century from a working class immigrant family. A woman who comes of age at a time when people said men don't make passes at girls who wear glasses, and it was not ironic, it was, it was life advice. Um, where, where your goal was to marry, to, to, to find the, the security of a family, where your opinion was not much asked for. Um, that was the 20th century. That was the reality for a lot of women coming of age through the 20th century. Um, so here's a character with a vivid, as we all have, a vivid interior life. Um, but coming of age at a time when not many options were, be, were open to her. And uh, so that was intriguing to me, but then there was also the sense that I haven't seen a lot of single women's voices full focus on the interior life, the intellectual life, the emotional life of a female character in contemporary fiction. Not a female character who's a pawn, not a female character who's a victim, um, as soon as you see something nice about her, you know she's going to be raped or murdered or dismembered somewhere in the novel. Um, but sort of to give the attention, I mean, this goes back to the sort of Willie Loman, attention must be paid, give the attention of uh, a literary approach to a character um, who, by her biography, does not seem to deserve it, um, does not seem intriguing enough. So those two things, both in her life and then in my life, in my, as a contemporary reader, um, made me say, oh, to hell with it. Yes, I know it's a stupid thing to do, but I'm going to write a novel that is completely given over to the voice of this woman. Brilliant. There's been a fairly intense debate recently about the amount of critical attention lavished on men writers and female writers. Uh, your first novel was reviewed by Ann Tyler. You've had other novels reviewed on the front of that other East Coast newspaper's book section. You've nominated, you've won all kinds of big prizes, so you're not an exemplary victim of, of chauvinism in the <laughs> literary world, are you? But do you see a problem with the way that novels by men and women are treated? Yeah, I do, I do. Um, I, I worry about my students, for instance. Um, you know, I, I, I do hear from many young women writers mm -hmm. who um, are writing in a male voice. Um, mm. Now. We're, we're writers, we should be able to write in any voice that the story requires. Um, but sometimes when I question young women writers about this, I hear that they're afraid that to write from a woman's point of view about the things that are important to the, a particular woman is, is to be relegated to writing chick lit. Um, if you write the breakup of a romance um, from a woman's point of view, um, you're writing chick lit. If you write the breakup of a romance from a man's point of view, you're either John Updike or Jonathan Franzen, um, and you get literary prizes. Um, so young writers, are, you know, they know this. They know this. They're, they're, they're reading. Um, and it worries me that, that any constraint should be put on, on any young writers, but certainly on young women writers who feel that the things that are important to them somehow will be better conveyed through a male point of view. I, I had a discussion with my son about the movie Boyhood, um, and he was saying, proud feminist that I've raised, you know, the mother in that movie really had the more interesting story, and it's too bad that they didn't, you know, have more of that story in the movie. And I said, and yeah, and the, and the little boy has a sister, right? And he said, yeah, she didn't get any, anything about that. And I see, and he said, yeah, but they'd have to call it girlhood, and who would go see that? <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Ah. Ah. You're, uh, <laughs> I mentioned your first novel, The Bigamous Daughter. Uh, it takes place in a vanity press, what we used to call a vanity press. Yes, we don't even use yeah, that term anymore, yeah. which shows you how much has changed. Uh, 
now with the rapid rise of e-books and self-publishing and self-publishing back in vogue, how has the business changed over your 30-year career? And it still continues to change so rapidly. It does, it does. Um, and, and I guess that's, you know, worrying about that is, is what um, I, I pay my agent for and, and I hope my publisher will do um, so that I don't have to think about it. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, how books get, get to readers, um, of course that's important, but I, I can't spend a lot of energy um, being concerned about it. I'm, I'm sure that you can, um, can sink deeply into a downloaded book as much as you sink into a, a paper copy. Um, it, of course, it's reading um, that, that we don't want to lose. Um, and it's the novel itself that we don't want to lose. Do you think um, we're losing it? Too many distractions? Too many other things to do? You know, of course, but it's always, you know, novels have always been sort of an elitist, <laughs> um, a, a, an elitist uh, gift, let's say. Um, but you know, I, I do I do worry about the quiet that's required. I mean, for me, the miraculous thing about a reading life um, is the simplest thing about it, and that is that when you're reading, when you're, you're sinking deeply into a book or a story or a poem, um, it's just your mind and the writer's mind, the reader's mind and the writer. That kind of silent communication, that voice with which we speak to ourselves the voice we don't ever really use in the world, you know, the, the, that running stream of consciousness that, that are our own thoughts, that's the voice we lend to a writer. It's not the voice we speak with, it's not, it, and it's, it's a beautiful, intimate, one-to-one -one, um, that cannot be duplicated any other way. And I, and I guess what worries me is that, um, that a, a generation who doesn't have time to be quiet um, a generation who's always checking what everybody else is looking at now and not comfortable with the solitude that allows for that one-on-one, -on -one one-to-one uh, one -one communion um, will, will not know how wonderful a gift it is. Um, I think once it's discovered, we all recognize it's something that feeds our souls or our spirits or gets us through this mortal life. Um, but, but to miss out on it, to miss out on it completely, to not understand um, the quiet that's required for that wonderful communion to happen is, is something that I sometimes worry about. Yeah, I worry about that too. But then you come here and you see you know, a thousand people. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very encouraging every year. Uh, one of your books, uh, That Night, has been adopted, uh, was adopted into a movie and that process just happens to be the subject of one of our new features this year, the, uh, the Great Books to Great Movies panel hosted by the Post film critic Ann Hornaday. What was it like seeing something, you know, that you'd worked on alone so intimately, <laughs> then taken over by a big crowd of people, some of whom you probably didn't even know, and splashed up on the screen? What was that like? Well, you know, on the one hand, it's fun. You know, you should never complain. Um, it, it, it's sort of a hoot, you know. Um, it, you impress all your friends, you know. People are not so impressed that you're publishing novels. It's what you do. But then you say, oh, a movie. Everybody pays. Oh, oh, that must mean something. Um, so it's, you know, Hollywood does things in a Hollywood way, and it's sort of fun to get involved with it. I, I have stayed away any... Um, with when that night was made and, and uh, with other books that people have, have written screenplays. I've, I've, I don't want to be a screenwriter. I don't want to go to Hollywood. I don't think movies are the superior art. I think they are an inferior art to the written word. I'm sorry, I believe that. Um, so I, it's not something I've always wanted to. <laughs> Don't tell anybody I said that. They do have more money in Hollywood than they have in publishing. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I never really got involved in it, but I, I have to say the, um, I did go up to the soundstage when that night was being filmed. Uh, it was filmed just up here in Baltimore, and uh, the director invited me to come up and bring the kids and let them see a soundstage and meet a couple of the actors. And at the time, I hadn't read the screenplay. I really, really kept the whole thing at arm's length. But we arrived at the... Uh, <laughs> at the soundstage and one of the actors, um, was a lovely guy, came up to me right away and took my hand and said, oh, I love your book, I love your book, and I'm so sorry what we're doing to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
that's great. Uh, <laughs> Would you take some questions from Please, the audience? Please, certainly, certainly. Uh, there are two microphones, one on this side and one on that side. <laughs> Alice, I first discovered your fiction 11 years ago when I read your charming book, A Child of My Heart. I fell in love with it because your protagonist's name was my name, Teresa, and I was a Catholic. <laughs> and I related so much to her summer of growing up at age 15. How much of you is in that character? Is it just the way you write that, that young girl on the cusp of maturity and what she has to go through as a babysitter and experiences, it, it's just, you felt, it feels like you put yourself so much into her. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, actually, there's nothing at all of me in her. Nothing. <laughs> I was never that girl. Um, I probably, there's more of me in the little cousin who worships her. Um, and, and I suppose, I, I, I think one of the things I was thinking of uh, when I was composing that novel was sort of that, and again, it's, it's, it's that sexist part of, um, there, it seems to me there are a lot of male novels um, about the younger boy looking up to the neater teenager or on the cusp of manhood guy and and we understand that relationship but I had seen enough in my own life and I had experienced as a, 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 a little girl looking up at the teenage girls who you know were better than adults because they they would talk to you and they were closer to you um, but seemed to inhabit a magical world um, so I was never that, I don't, I don't know that I, there were any kids ever looking, I was too short, they, nobody was ever <laughs> looking up to me, but I understood that feeling of, of looking up at someone who seems to have entered that magical realm. So it was interesting for me to then write first person from the point of view of that, that admired teenager who I never was. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. Thank you, thank you. Um, you spoke a little bit about writing in a single woman's voice and um, kind of the worries that people have about the perception of women's voices being dismissed as chick lit. Um, but I was wondering if you've like, seen any progress being made or over the course of your career if that's changed at all the way the public perceives that and the literary word, world perceives that. I mean, I guess the thing that discourages me is I, I feel like this is a fairly recent phenomenon. I, I think we've gone backwards in some ways and it may be that the, the, this whole idea of chick lit, which didn't exist so much um, 20 years ago. Um, but I think, I think feminism has faded just enough, um, and, and uh, the commercial, I mean, it's our culture, you know? I mean, it's certainly not just literature. Um, I don't watch a lot of television, but I know there are an awful lot of dead young women on, uh, being served up as entertainment on most of the major t uh, channels. Um, I'm not sure that that was true 20 or 30 years ago. So I think a lot of it is the culture um, that, that women are in some way stepping back, maybe because um, we're scaring uh, the powers that be. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I was a young writer, uh, writing about women's things, these feminist writers were really coming into their own. Um, and when I started in graduate school, we were all reading The Woman's Room. Um, we were all reading Fear of Flying, you know. Um, what, what, what the feminist writers had to say seemed important and seemed one with the literary world that we were entering. I don't think that's so much the case now for the young writers that I teach. I don't think they're seeing uh, feminism as, as a legitimate part of the literary conversation. So in some ways I feel like we've taken a little bit of a step backward. Um, as far as acknowledging, um, not so much women writers. I, I, I don't think that uh, we have to, women writers have to struggle to find a place at the table, and certainly my career, you know, as I'm so grateful for, is part of that. Um, but there is that sense of how many women writers are being read um, because they're writing from a male point of view, or they're writing about uh, the male experience. Um, Marilyn Robinson is a fabulous writer, and Housekeeping was a beautiful book, but Gilead really set her soaring, and it was written from a man's point of view. 
Yes, sir. Um, pardon me. Um, you reminded me of a book I was reading this winter, The Golden Notebook, which I believe won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and um, that was about uh, British communists and fighting in the, um, World War II in South Africa. And um, that book had, there were several different books besides the Golden Notebook in the novel. And I was wondering, you're talking about a male voice versus a female voice. Um, she had several different books for her different voices. And I was wondering, wondering if you ever had um, you know, a point of view where you, you felt like you were torn and you needed to go at it from more than one perspective for the same character or, you know. Yes, something. certainly. And The Golden Notebook, again, it was part of feminist reading um, when I was uh, sort of coming of age as a writer, very much so. Um, yes, I have. And, and again, I, this the thing that makes me uncomfortable about this whole conversation is that there should be no rules. <laughs> you know, uh, women writers shouldn't feel compelled to write from women's points of view, um, and male writers shouldn't feel hesitant to write from women's point of view. I mean, you need to write. The demands of the story and the character are essential. Um, I did, um, and after this, I did, uh, I've, I've written from male point of view, and that story needed male points of view. That story sort of needed to circulate among the various characters uh, that the novel w was about. And it, I didn't think twice about entering uh, the points of view of the male members of that family. It was essential to the story. I did, however, writing someone, occasionally think, and this was just my own lack of courage, nothing else, that, you know, I've got some male characters in here who have had really interesting stories. You know, one is the guy who becomes a priest and then he leaves, and I don't know, does he have sexual things? That, that might be interesting. Um, Marie marries a man who was a POW um, at, at, at the end of the Second World War in a camp in the Baltic. And every once in a while, I think, boy, I could really show them what a writer I am, you know, if I would just, you know, leave Marie for a while and, and give the guys a chance to talk. And I realized, but I would be undercutting exactly what I set out to do. Well, Miss McDermott, just remember um, Adidas, all day I dream about sex. <laughs> so you might want to do that. Thank you. Uh, yes, you mentioned that you were recognized by a professor uh, early in your writing career as, as a novelist, as a writer. I'm wondering if you're discovering writers today as you teach. I believe that you are a professor at Johns Hopkins. And do you see anything different in their writing process today with all the technology that they have available to them that was not available when you were starting out. Thank you, yeah. Um, I certainly do um, recognize wonderful young writers. It's one of the great pleasures of, of teaching um, in an MFA program like Hopkins. Um, uh, I don't think the technology uh, has much influence. At least I don't, I don't recognize anything yet um, that, that has changed. Um, I mean, the marvelous thing uh, at Hopkins, we have students who come into our MFA program who could do absolutely anything else. They're so smart and they're so dedicated. They could be lawyers, they could be doctors. They, they have the world open to them given their talents and their intelligence and they want to write literary fiction. Some of them even want to be poets. <laughs> you know? I love it. I love it. It's so encouraging and they do and they want to be writers because they have read works that have changed their lives. They have felt the thrill of being, of lending their inner voice to a great writer, and, and they have experienced that. Um, and that has not changed over the 30 some odd years that I've been teaching. That, that hunger to go and do likewise, um, once you have been enchanted by the written word, um, has not changed, despite whether they write on um, computers or uh, notebooks with pens or um, as some of them still do and as I do uh, with a Bic pen and a legal pad. Um, it's still the thing that gets them uh, at, at the, into their careers is that um, they've been blown away by the beauty of our language. Um, that doesn't change. Wow, wow. Thank you so much. It's Thank been you. great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks all for being here.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.